So from my perspective, I've never been more optimistic that Canada can actually bend its commission's curve downwards once and for all. Welcome to Global Energy Show's 5x5 series. I'm Rachel Gregory. Joining us today is Professor Monica Gattinger, Director of the Institute for Science, Society and Policy and Chair of Positive Energy at the University of Ottawa. Welcome, Monica, and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Monica, what are the key opportunities and obstacles for Canada in aspiring to net zero by 2050? 2050 is really interesting in terms of opportunities because it opens the door to both short and long-term thinking. There are lots of opportunities for innovation and as well as technology deployment to reduce emissions. I think in terms of the obstacles, it's less about technology and more kind of cultural and institutional, right? So how do we do a better job of fostering and alignment and collaboration from the lab bench to start up to scale up and vice versa? How do we articulate a clear and positive role for the oil and gas sector? And many of our debates tend to be pretty simplistic uh, and polarized. And how do we ensure that we've got the policy and regulatory systems in place that we're going to need to support innovation and technology deployment? Are you optimistic that Canada can achieve its international climate targets? Canada has some very ambitious targets. Canada recently upped its ambition to reduce emissions to 40 to 45 percent below 2005 levels by 2030. That equates to almost cutting them in half in about eight years. So I, I find that, you know, quite ambitious and challenging for the country to achieve, to put it mildly. That said, I think we're at a hinge point in the country. There's a lot more consensus between business and government and Canadians about the need for climate action. We've got a lot of the measures in place now, carbon price across the country, uh, the federal climate plan and the like. So from my perspective, I've never been more optimistic that Canada can actually bend its commission's curve downwards once and for all. What do you see as the most important next steps for Canada on energy and climate? It might sound a bit strange, but I actually think implementation is the most important next step. We often look at climate models, right, that lay out, okay, if we, if governments do this and industry does that, here's where we'll get. But we don't necessarily plan for what it takes to actually implement those measures in a way that's going to be feasible and effective in the real worlds of energy systems, of federalism, of reconciliation with Indigenous communities and the need for public support for projects. So that's really going to be crucial. It's really important that we have an integrated approach to energy and climate. We often make energy policy and climate policy in silos, right? So we don't necessarily have that integrated approach that solves for both not only emissions reductions, but also energy imperatives. Have you noticed a difference in how people, particularly youth, are looking at climate change. And how do you think this will impact the way energy is extracted and consumed? Canadians' level of climate ambition has increased over time, including in the context of the pandemic. Youth are very ambitious on climate. There's also growing attention to energy affordability and reliability. People are gonna be looking at the cost competitiveness of competing energy sources. I think the other thing I would point to, especially for youth, is that increasingly concern over climate change is also wrapped up with concern over issues around equity, diversity and inclusion and social justice. So when it comes to energy development and thinking about energy consumption, increasingly we see young people looking at that through a racial lens, through an indigenous lens, through a gender lens. And I think what that means for companies is that things like ESG are going to be really important going forward. Now let's take it to COP26. What do you think will be the key learnings from COP this year? And how do you think it will initiate decision-making from global leaders? I think there's lots of momentum around 2050 and net zero by 2050. You know, that IEA report carving up decision-making between now and 2030 and now in 2050. I think that's really useful, a really useful way for leaders to think about the future. On the negative side, I think we're still seeing a really big disconnect between ambition 
an action. And I think we still sometimes fall into the trap of confusing ambitious targets with effective actions. So, you know, my hope would be that we see global leaders, not just from government, but also from industry, from civil society, from the financial community, Indigenous leaders, that they begin to turn to questions of implementation. Thank you, Monica. It was so wonderful chatting with you um, and getting your take on the energy industry, climate targets, and where we're headed. So thank you so much for taking the time. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Rachel. And thank you for watching Global Energy Show's 5x5 five five series. Be sure to like this video, share it to your networks, and subscribe to Global Energy Show's YouTube channel so you can stay up to date with all of our new 5x5 five five episodes and videos. We'll see you next week.